and welcome to News Hour on Trust TV. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. In the headlines, again, ISWAP abducts 15 persons in Borno State. Kano APC crisis deepens, campaign office set ablaze. Farmers in Gombe share experience on impediments to bumper harvest in beans production. And on the foreign news, Germany to impose lockdown on unvaccinated considers general vaccine mandate. And now the news in detail. At least 15 people have been allegedly abducted by suspected fighters of the Islamic State for West African province, ISWAP. Daily Trust reports that the victims were abducted in Dembua local government area of Borno State. The report said the insurgents struck near Gumsari village in Dembua and waylaid motorists and forcefully took them into Sambisa forest. According to Daily Trust reports, some staff of international non-governmental organizations are among the victims, mostly young people who left Dambua town while heading for Adamawa on Wednesday. The incident is coming hours after staff of the Borno State Ministry of Works, who were supervising the construction of about 45-kilometer chibok Dambua road, were kidnapped. Communities in Munya local government area of Niger State have been coerced by the bandits terrorizing the area to supply packs of cigarettes and wraps of Indian hemp to secure the release of their family members. Daily Trust reports that a member of the security committee in the area said the items were delivered to bandits on Tuesday before some of the victims were released. The bandits also demand for maize flour, packs of maggi and five jerry cans of petrol which families also had to deliver Daily Trust recalls that several people in Zazaga, Chibani and other neighboring communities in Munya local government area of the state have been in captivity for the past two weeks. Justice Binte Inyako of Federal High Court in Abuja on Thursday rescheduled a trial of the detained leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra in Amdi Kanu from January 19th to January 18th, 2022. The shift in the trial date followed the abridgment of time granted by the judge following a passionate plea to that effect. The last adjourned date for the trial is January 18th. Trust TV's Murdia Umar has the report. The leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra Namdikanu was absent in court during the continuation of his trial at the Federal High Court in Abuja. Counsel to Namdikanu had approached the court with an application seeking an order of the court to accommodate the trial in November and December this year as against the earlier January 19, 2022 date. Justice Inyako, however, informed Kanu's lawyer that the application for time abridgment cannot be granted because there was no judicial time for such an issue. Following the insistence, Justice Inyako agreed to shift all the cases slated for January 18 to accommodate the trial which would last till January 19 and 20. Days past, we have um, had cause to come before this court to fire content proceedings against the DGSSS following their flagrant disobedience to court orders. Uh, so, and those applications haven't been heard. Uh, and we also have also incorporated the facts of the manner in which they are flouting these court orders. And I itemize the orders of the court who they flouted. Uh, uh, so those um, applications are still before the court will inform the court. The court may run out and say, if in the event they proceed to flout any of these orders, the court handed down today, that we should come back to court. Uh, so, and we believe that they will obey court orders made today, we believe strongly, most strongly. So uh, we are coming back on January 18th for the hearing of the, of the application challenging the judge of the court on 18th of January. Uh, we walked away with something, but that's not really what we wanted. We wanted to move that application challenging the jurisdiction of the court. That is key to our defense strategy. But that we were not able to move that application today is not pleasing to us. But we can understand the procedural uh, constraints uh, within which the court had to operate today. We went through all that and um, it was something uh, quite a little bit out of ordinary. But it's, at least we went home, uh, we're going home with something. Improvement in his in our clients' detention conditions uh, is something that has been uh, critical in our own reckoning, and we got that improvement as court order today. This thing amounts to disrespect to the Constitution. This is infuriating, this is inciting, this is unfair. And, I, and, I, and that's why I felt so bad seeing how these things are going on. And I'm saying that 
like I said before, is supposed to be a prosecution. It's not a persecution. And this perception keeps sending message out there that most of these actions are prepared by hate. So if a man cannot be tried transparently with access to all facilities that is required for him to prove his case, then this can turn to become a kangaroo arrangement. Why not just, like I always say, why not send him to Daura and then convict him? Justice Inyako ordered the Department of State Services to allow Kanu to practice his faith, change his clothes and be given the maximum possible comfort in the detention facility. <laughs> As you can see, the ambience around the Federal High Court in Abuja is rather a rowdy one because the cancel to Namdi Kanu and some supporters of Namdi Kanu are not really happy about what happened in the courtroom today. They said they sent several applications for consideration, but it was not really looked into. Martia Umar, Trust TV News, Abuja. Police in Kanu has announced the arrest of 13 suspected hoodlums in connection with the attack and setting ablaze the campaign office of Senator Baro Jibrin, a senator representing Kanu North. The police spokesman, Abdullah Kiawa, in a statement said the thugs were arrested alongside dangerous weapons and illicit drugs, adding that normalcy has since been restored and the situation under control. He also added that investigation has commenced and the suspect will be charged to court for prosecution. Meanwhile, 29 people have so far been confirmed dead, while 13 others still unaccounted for from the canoe boat accident. Trust TV's correspondent Idris Jibrin, who visited Magwe local government, reports that search and rescue operation is still ongoing within the river. His report. Behind me is Badao village, where the victims are said to have been coming from. According to the resident here, even though there is another route down there that the people can easily follow, and pass through to uh, Bagway Township, but it's a bit difficult. This is the easiest way they can follow from that Bado village to Bagway Township. Now, I asked the people here, they told me that there are about 48 people inside the boats that are capsized here, and that about 20 people have died, while some are still inside the water. Now, there are fire service officials around, who are carrying out the rescue operation but because of the nature of the water the breeze that is blowing they cannot enter inside the river as of now they have to wait until late evening before they enter in the meantime there are at least 13 people inside this uh, river that have not been found so they are going to continue their struggle until they find the remaining people that are inside here few others are still in the hospital undertaking uh, treatment here in Bagwai. On Tuesday, November 30th, 2021, a group of men, women and children, numbering 49, were said to have left Bado village to Bagwai town where in Maulud. Karamar hukum za su hauro nan karamar hukumar bagwai za su je a bisa kan maulidi za su je ta'azim ziyara can karamar hukumar dawaki dawakin tufa wannan abu ya faru halfway inside this river their boat was said to have capsized killing 20 on the spots further search and rescue exercise recovered nine other victims we rescued about uh, 20 people unconscious, then nine, um, seven of them are alive and uh, combine them to general hospital for medical attention. These people are mostly friends and relatives of the victims who are either still inside the river or have been removed for burial. They said the water transportation is the easiest and safest means of transportation for them around this part of Kano State. But there are inadequate modern boats for that purposes. Government 
ya magaruba aka na hadar aka makon da jirgin ya debo dalibai wajen su 45 ina so ya hayo nan to Allah bai da ba aga ya kawo kara kwana gaba daya saka abun nan saka saka rasu meanwhile the Kano state fire service confirmed that officials of the agency will continue to remain on site until the remaining victims are recovered. Idris Jubrin, Trust TV News, Kanu. Kaduna State Government has announced plans to dismiss 233 teachers who presented fake certificates. Chairman of the State Universal Basic Education Board, Tijan Abdullahi, stated this at a news briefing on Thursday. The chairman said as part of its responsibility to ensure that all teachers actually have the qualifications they presented, the board launched a certificate verification exercise in April 2021, explaining that the major objective of the exercise is to ensure that teachers have the requisite credentials that constitute the basic qualifications for their employment. He said the board verified 451 certificates by contacting the institutions that awarded the certificates in which nine of the 13 institutions contacted responded, adding that the board will continue to check the integrity of the certificates presented by teachers to ensure that the profession is not devalued by imposters. Ministry of Interior on Thursday published the photos of prison inmates who escaped from Joss Medium Security Custodial Center on Sunday. The ministry on Thursday shared the details of the remaining 252 still on the run and advised the public to report to the nearest police station if they come in contact with the persons, warning that they are dangerous. The ministry also warned that it is a crime punishable by law to render any form of assistance to an escaped inmate. Some 262 inmates escaped from the facility on November 28th, but the Interior Ministry said 10 of them have been recaptured. The jailbreak in Jos is the 15th of such incident in the last one year, and eight of those attacks have been successful. You're still watching News Hour on Trust TV. Coming up after the break, traders return to familiar terrain. Do stay with us. issues and breaking news by downloading the Trust TV mobile app on your Android devices. Go online, click Google Play Store, search Trust TV, install the app and get doses of unfiltered information on happenings all over the world in your pocket. Trust TV, documenting the Nigerian story. Nigerian Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. Let's take a look at our so top stories. At least 15 people have been allegedly abducted by suspected fighters of the Islamic State, West Africa province, Iswap. And police in Kanu has announced the arrest of 13 suspected hoodlums in connection with the attack and setting ablaze the campaign office of Senator Barrow Jibrin, a senator representing Kanu North. 
Moving on to other stories now, the emergence of Omicron variant of the coronavirus, which has identified, has raised concerns among scientists, health officials and the general public across the globe, especially in Nigeria. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization has described it as a variant of concern, as the global body warned that the global risks posed by it were very high. Two cases have already been confirmed in Nigeria, even as Canada imposes a ban on Nigerian travelers. Director Logistics and Health Commodities, National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, Kubora Daradara, speaks on the variant on Trust TV's morning show, Daybreak. Um, actually, Omicron was first detected in South Africa. What the South Africans are saying is because they have an advanced genome sequencing. That is why people are saying it was first detected in Africa and South Africa. So we don't actually know where it came from. Though it's been said that it was first detected in South Africa. So for now, the tests are still going on. But from what we are hearing, it's going to be more virulent than the other variants that we have seen before. Yeah. But tests are still ongoing so that we can see the difference between it and the other variants that we have had. These COVID-19 vaccines that we are using, the Pfizer, the Moderna, the AstraZeneca, are still effective against the Omicron. So you have to note that what the vaccine does it's, is that it strengthens your immune system. So that even when the uh, COVID-19 virus enters you, you have already developed a sort of immunity, so you don't really come down with the illness. So it's still effective. These uh, vaccines we have they are still effective against the Omicron virus. Stigmatization of people living with HIV AIDS, as well as lack of medical tests to no status, remain the biggest challenge facing the fight against the spread of the disease in Nigeria. According to World Health Organization, HIV remains a major public health issue that affects millions of people worldwide, which division, disparity and disregard for human rights are among the failures that allow HIV to become and remain a global health crisis. The report. River State Government, through the State Ministry of Health, said the government is committed to enlightenment campaign and activism in the fight against human immunodeficiency virus HIV and acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS. Director, Disease Control in the River State Primary Healthcare Board, Dr. Iarawo Ekanem, during an enlightenment campaign held in Port Harcourt, expresses worry that pregnant women who pass through the traditional birth attendants are never tested for the HIV AIDS. The primary health care system are focused on the communities and the primary health settings and to make sure that we meet up with the inequalities. You know, because most people, especially in the rural communities, and what we have noticed is that pregnant women, many pregnant women, are not having access to being tested because of the impact of the traditional bed attendance. A lot of our pregnant women still patronize traditional bed attendance, where testing may not take place there. So we want to go and get them in their homes, in their houses, in their villages, in their nooks and crannies. It is there we get them and test them and bring them to the, to the system where they can have access to drugs and be protected. Health official in the state, Dr. Ufoma Edewo, said there is need for more bursts of energy to end stigma, HIV transmission and isolation experienced by people living with the virus. The more we have persons that we've been able to identify that are living positively with HIV AIDS, the more, the less the chances the transmission is because once they are on these drugs that are very good that suppresses the virus, the, they will no longer be able to transmit it either to their sexual partners or to children. Some people living with HIV AIDS in River State say many of them lost their jobs due to their status. They complain that despite the campaigns to end stigmatization, people living with the virus are still going through unimaginable discrimination in workplaces. You find out that sometimes most people that are living with the virus, you go out there, see them being stigmatized. So we are trying to say, even from the health workers, some, 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 self, some, some of them stigmatize themselves as well, feeling that their whole world is collapsed. So we are creating an awareness, they are telling them that HIV is a virus, it's not a moral issue. People should live healthy and be fine with it. One of the challenges is stigma. But from those who are having the issue and also those who 
they associate with stigma is still high. Maybe because of this uh, the bill on stigma is not really enforced. If not stigma is high. And most times a lot of people who have it, they stigmatize against themselves. Let the people come out of their self-stigma and assess treatment. And by the time a lot of people assess treatment, believe in the HIV prevalence will go down very well. And also stigma too will go down. The theme of World AIDS Day 2021 is End Equalities, End AIDS, with a special focus on reaching people left. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Gbajagbi Amila, has cautioned all Nigerians against the devastating effects of misinformation on nation building. Gbajagbi Amila gave the advice on Thursday at a two day national conference on information organized by the House of Representatives Committee on Information, National Orientation, Ethics and Values in Abuja. The report. Gbajagbi Amila charged leaders and followers in the country to combat fake news, saying it is central to the unity of the country. He said that technology tools have made information gathering and dissemination cheaper. According to him, citizens all over have become broadcasters and publishers capable of influencing the opinions of many from the quiet of their enclaves. In Nigeria, with our diverse cultures and religions still working towards achieving a more perfect union, Hate speech and other forms of misinformation and disinformation can quickly have a devastating real-world effect. Therefore, countering misinformation by whatever proper and legal means are available to us is not a theoretical question, but a responsibility that goes to the heart of our ability to continue to exist as one nation in peace, unity, and prosperity. Let us be aware that in trying to prevent the worst consequences of misinformation and hate speech, there is a danger of going too far in ways that smother the marketplace of ideas and deprive citizens of their free speech rights. That would be most unfortunate. And as leaders and government policymakers, we must avoid that outcome by all means. Earlier, the Chairman House Committee on Information, National Orientation, Ethics and Values, Olusha Debumi, said that the importance of information management to national development cannot be overemphasized. The parliamentarian said information literacy was very significant for any country, especially diverse countries like Nigeria. We as people, community and government must ask ourselves for what purpose, to what end, and in which manner do we move from present phase of development of our nation to the next? Once such vision is identified, the major tool for making that vision a mantra on our way of life is through proper information generation, management and dissemination of information. Unfortunately, we as Nigerians have engaged ourselves mainly in social media adventurism and economic gain until recently the strength when the certain developments at one point or the other show us the strength in our unity and the need to see Nigeria as a project that requires the collective effort for prosperity. In his goodwill message, Representatives Anyekun Umana also stressed that proper information management has not been given its deserved consideration in the society. According to him, it has consistently resulted in unguided environment for promotion of hate speech and fake news that has become the order of the day and accompanied by its negative consequences. In order that we can have a proper estimation of the challenge at hand, peace, social harmony and inter-ethnic reproachment are the prerequisites for genuine national development. We do, have, we do not have these preconditions at the moment in our country, which accounts for the current stalemate in the national development and declining foreign investment inflow. I think, therefore, that the challenge is first and foremost on how to deploy information, information tool for the deliberate purpose of building confidence, trust, and consensus amongst our various people on any issue or subject of national interest. The International Day of Persons with Disabilities is a day for championing the rights of persons with disabilities and to increase awareness of the challenges individuals face globally. 
the 2021 theme for IDPD is leadership and participation of persons with disabilities towards an inclusive, accessible and sustainable post-COVID-19 world. Trust TV's Aisha Salehu speaks to some Nigerians about the living conditions of persons living with disabilities. The International Day of Persons with Disabilities, marked on December 3rd, has two primary goals to promote the full and equal participation of persons with disabilities and to ensure the inclusion of persons with disabilities in all aspects of society and development. According to the World Health Organization's 2020 World Disability Report, over 1 billion people live with some form of disability. Many of them face a number of human rights abuses, including stigma, discrimination, violence, and lack of access to health care, housing, and education. In Nigeria, there are 31 million people living with disabilities as disclosed by the National Commission for Persons with Disability. Musa Ahmadu speaks about the challenges he faces as a person living with disability. My whole life as I am physically challenged person now, so matter of two, I am in hard condition. So as I am telling you right now, the place that I am staying, I am staying in Karmajiji. There is a one place we physically challenge people that we are staying. But the life is hard. Sometimes, even to pay children's school, sometimes they will show my children from school to the home if I didn't pay the school fees. So in this business, as I am telling you before, everything is moving forward. But right now, at least now, sometimes when I came here, from money to now, I'm not selling any single phone. Before I'm selling only phones. That is the reason I joined Charger EIP's memory card. Even though I don't sell this one, sometimes I can sell this one. So I will get water, I will eat, and to go and feed my family. Meanwhile, some Nigerians also expressed their thoughts on the living conditions of persons living with disabilities in the country. It's so uh, sympathetic. Because why I say that is that Nigeria doesn't even... Uh, care for uh, 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 Nigeria don't even look whether they exist or they are not exist. But if it is a, a, a country that know, knows their citizen and know that these people they, are, they can't do anything, they would have to place them monthly payment. The government should just do something about them by empowering them, opening maybe a foundation where they can be helped. You know, <laughs> so because the rate of disabled people in Nigeria today is too high. They should be carried along because they went, they all, most of them are educated too. So uh, we can see they are even the one that boasts our Olympic and went for our athletics for football, uh, for our athletics last time. They have, so they don't even got good medals in Nigeria. So they should be carried along in anything we are doing. In January 2018, President Muhammad Buhari signed into law the Discrimination Against Persons with Disabilities Act. This act states that public organizations shall, as much as possible, constitute at least 5% of their staff population. Aisha Salihu, Trust TV News, Abuja. Beans is consumed in most households in Nigeria. It is also a cash crop that boosts the economic well-being of Nigerian farmers. Cross-section of beans farmers in Gombe State speak to Trust TV's Ibrahim Ismail on the outcome of the 2021 farming season. How far? Well, the beans we are on it, it is today we started packing. We don't know what will be of it. But as you can see, the base is good. At, this, at least this year, there is a sign of getting a bomber harvest in beans. Gaskia, 
Dani yana yin da muka samu. Da kake gani ya kawo haka? Ah, to ina gani rashi ne ya kawo haka, ba taki ba komai. After nearly two years of absence following the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, Kano State International Trade Fair has returned. Though the usual large turnout of traders and exhibitors is not visible at this time, Trust TV's correspondent Idris Jibril reports that the fair is significant to the state business community, but the low turnout of people, as against previous fairs, raises concerns. <laughs> The 2021 Kano International Trade Fair is organized to consolidate the challenges of COVID-19 pandemic to opportunities for growth and development of micro, small and medium enterprises in Nigeria. Uh, connecting business to business, that's the main essence of uh, uh, trade fair. It's not the situation where you come and sell your products, but you come and showcase your new products or to promote what you have. That's the main essence of the, uh, the a trade fair and you can see we have a lot of participants from various countries you can see some of the international flags and even during the opening ceremony we host some ambassadors that comes from some countries however occasioned by the covid 19 effect on global economy the Kano's trade fair appeared low-key although there are present participants from various countries of the world but they say the showcase is not like before due to the rising cost of goods and services and low turnout of people into this year's trade fair. Still, uh, it's normal, people is coming the normal, but I say not too much people, but I think this is normal in uh, Kano trade fair. The first five, six days, not too much people come. But inshallah, there will be movement the week up the trade fair. I come here before 17 years. Every year I come Kano trade fair from Egypt to here. Meanwhile, micro, small and medium business operators are still trying to set up tents nearly five days since the trade fair was declared open. Uh, actually, last year I never come. Uh, two years ago I come. The trade fair is very successful, it's very good. So last year I never come because of the corona. But this year I come, but now the business start small, small. So people is going to complaining, no money, no money because of the coward. Dollar is too much high. So because of this small effect, but not big issue, but a small effect for this thing because the thing is very expensive now for the whole world. The 2021 Kano International Trade Fair is expected to provide opportunities for small-scale businesses to recover after the threats posed by the COVID-19 global pandemic on the state's economy. Idris Jubrin, Trust TV News, Kano. President Muhammadu Buhari has transmitted Finance Bill 2021 to the House of Representatives for consideration. The Speaker, Femi Bajabi Amila, read the letter during plenary on Thursday. According to the President, the bill seeks to support the implementation of the 2022 Federal Budget of Economic Growth and Sustainability by proposing key reforms to specific taxation, customs, excise, fiscal and other relevant laws. He said the bill specifically provides, among others, to enhance domestic revenue mobilization efforts, to increase tax and non-tax revenues, as well as seeks to implement financial sector reforms to support ongoing capital market reforms relating to securities lending transactions, real estate investment, unit trust schemes, and the recapitalization of the insurance companies. Now let's join Chamun Dabeng with business news.
welcome to Business News on Trust TV. I am Chamun Dabeng. Speaker of the House of Representatives Femi Baja Biamila has directed the formation of an ad hoc committee to carry out the investigation and determine the inventories of the assets and liabilities of the defunct NNPC and its subsidiaries transferred to NNPC Limited. This comes after the adoption of a motion moved by Ibrahim Isiaka APC Ogun at plenary on Wednesday, who noted that Section 88 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999, as amended, empowers the National Assembly to carry out investigations into matters on which it has powers to make laws. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has urged Nigerian banks to set up branches in South Africa as the country signs more pacts with Nigeria on power, oil and gas and other areas. President Ramaphosa, who spoke about the new pact, said both countries have signed about 32 agreements. President Mohamedou Buhari said the signing of the pact is for the progress and prosperity of citizens of both countries, further noting that the inauguration of the Joint Ministerial Advisory Council on Industry, Trade and Investment would enable the private sectors of the two largest economies in Africa to further promote economic cooperation and development. Chadian Ambassador to Nigeria, Abakar Jahaimi, has called for partnership with the Nigerian government to connect its power source to the Nigerian national grid. The ambassador stated this during his visit to the Minister of Power, Abubakar Aliu. Abakar, however, urged the minister to reopen the proposed partnership on interconnection, stating that both countries stand to benefit from the partnership. The Minister of Power assured that there would be continuous interaction on power interconnection with Chad as Nigeria is committed to regional integration. Comptroller General of Customs has decried the continuous degradation of Nigeria's forest and illegal extinction and exporting of wildlife by foreigners from the Middle East. Team A team of the service said they seized 61 containers of wood with duty payment value of 6 billion naira, 36 containers of charcoal, 381 million naira, and 1,110 pieces of raw hides and skin in 185 sacks worth 61 million naira from October and November 2020. Further stating that some of the seizures were contrary to import guidelines and evasion of duty payment to the government. International Monetary Fund have expressed their concerns of a rising sovereign domestic debt, which is said to have hit 50% of total public debt stock at the end of last year. This comes amid concerns over the rising exposure of Nigerian banks to the government. Last year, the reported total commercial loans to the government rose from 1.5 trillion naira to 1.77 trillion naira, a year-on-year -year increase of 18%. The fund, which offered theoretical advisory on domestic debt restructuring DD are said the ratio of sovereign domestic debt of emerging markets and developing economies to their total debt profiles rose from 31 to 46 percent between 2000 and 2020. In line with deepening capital markets, IMF has cautioned countries in considering the sort of local debt restructuring Nigeria contemplates in the case of the WMF that such exercise is not an off the shelf item. Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, on Thursday says Nigeria's external reserves fell by $610 million last month. The governor of the CBN, Godwin Emefiela, stated this at the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria's dinner in Lagos. Emefiela said the figure shows that the reserves dropped to 41.22 billion naira as of November 29th from 41.83 billion naira on October 29th. According to the Apex Bank, at the present level, the external reserves could meet the country's nine-month import demand, noting that the reserves, which had gained 5 billion naira in October, returned to a downward path in November. Governor of Cross River State, Ben Ayade, has described the death of the Second Republic Senate President, Joseph Wires, as a monumental loss to Cross River State in particular, and Nigeria as a whole. According to a statement from Governor Ayade's office, Wires died on Tuesday in the London hospital, leaving an indelible footprint on the sands of time. Late Wires has been confined to a London hospital bed for over six months over health-related issues. And now we'll take some news from the foreign scene. German Chancellor Angela Merkel says that people who are unvaccinated will be excluded from non-essential stores, cultural and recreational venues, and Parliament will consider a general vaccine mandate that would come into force from February. Also on Thursday, India, Finland and Norway became the latest countries to report cases of the new Omicron coronavirus variant as regulators in the United Kingdom 
give the green light for the use of a monoclonal therapy called sotrovimab to treat those of high risk of developing severe COVID-19 symptoms. The news came as South Korea's daily coronavirus cases rose to a new high with authorities halting quarantine exemptions for fully vaccinated inbound travelers for two weeks in a bid to fend off the new variant. The United Kingdom has approved the use of a drug to treat people at high risk of developing severe COVID-19 symptoms, which the manufacturers say appear to be effective against the new Omicron variant. The Medicines and Healthcare Product Regulatory Agency said in a statement on Thursday that the antibody treatment Sotrovimab has found to be safe and effective at reducing the risk of hospitalization and death in people with mild to moderate COVID-19 infection who are at an increased risk of developing severe disease. Tests are ongoing to confirm the results against all the Omicron mutations, but an update is expected by year-end. United States Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has met his Russian counterpart as the divide between Moscow and Washington widens over Ukraine. Blinken's talks with Sergei Lavrov took place on Thursday on the sidelines of a summit of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in Stockholm, where foreign ministers from the group 57 members discussed key regional security issues. The high-level Russia-US meeting came after weeks of tension with Kyiv and its Western allies voicing concern over a significant build-up of Russia troops near the frontier with Ukraine. And finally, Iran's top diplomat says an agreement to revive his country's nuclear deal with world powers is within reach. Foreign Minister Hussein Amir Abdullahian said on Twitter on Thursday that negotiations in the Austrian capital of Vienna are proceeding with seriousness and that the removal of sanctions was a fundamental priority. The talks aimed at reviving the 2015 nuclear deal between Iran and several world powers as talk between Britain, China, France, Germany, Russia and the United States resumed on Monday after Iran passed them in June following the election of President Ibrahim Raisi. The US, which unilaterally pulled out of the deal in 2018, is only participating in the talks indirectly at Iran's insistence. You're still watching News Hour on Trust TV. The news continues after this break. <laughs> Welcome back. Now for the latest sports news, let's join Adeni Ajishafe. Technical advisor of the senior men national handball team, coach Rafiu Salami, has invited KSV KS player Farouk Yusuf, Israel based Obina Ani, and 28 other players for intensive camping ahead of the 2022 African Men's Handball Championship holding in Morocco. 30 players arrive at Abuja for camping after the executive board of the Handball Federation of Nigeria, HFN, approved the list of players in preparation for the nation's Cup. Several players who participated at the just-concluded Prudent Energy Handball Premier League were invited. Some of the players are goalkeeper Sonny Baturi and his Canopilla teammate Steven Suso, Christian Ogendembe, Confluence Stars duo of Anthony Agada and Cameroon-born Michael John, and Shokuto Rima's Abbas Mohamed. Coach Rafiu Salami will be assisted by league-winning Cardinal Pillars gaffer Solomon Yola and goalkeeper trainer Shegun Tuji. Nigeria has participated in 11 editions of the African Men Handball Nations Cup with their best outing in 1998. 
African Men Handball Championship will commence on January 13 to 22, 2022, and it is the African qualifying tournament for the 2023 World Men's Handball Championship in Poland and Sweden. Nigeria's Rivers United FC says they have been receiving threats from Al Masri fans ahead of their clash in the Confederation of African Football Cup as they prepare to face the post Sahel Giants Al Masri this Sunday. Rivers United says many of the club's delegation were denied visas in an attempt to destabilize the team before the encounter, as they have contacted the Confederation of African Football Foreign Affairs Commission and the Nigerian Embassy in Egypt to inform them of the situation. Media officer of Rivers United, Charles Mayuku, says some members of Rivers United contingent for the Thai have been denied entry visa into Egypt by the Egyptian Embassy, including two journalists. Meanwhile, Al Masri Vice President Mohamed El Kohli says they will be filing a complaint against Rivers United for the poor treatment they received during their stay in Nigeria. Pride of Rivers raced to a 2 1 victory in the first leg at the Ayimba International Stadium in Aba, and a draw of victory will be good enough to progress into the group phase of the competition. Norwegian 400 meter holder Casting Warholm and Jamaican pre sprinter Elaine Thompson, Hera, have been named World Athletes of the Year. Warholm won his award for beating the 29 year world record and taking Olympic gold in 2021. His time of 45.94 seconds is widely considered one of the greatest Olympic track performances of all time. Topsin Hera took the women's award for achieving the sprint double at his second consecutive Olympics. She beat compatriot Shelley and Fraser Price to the 100 meter gold in Tokyo and head of Namibia teenager Christine Mboma to retain her 200 meter title. Repeating the Olympic double she won at Rio 2016. Topsin Hera also clocked 10.54 seconds over 100 meters and 21.53 seconds over 200 meters to move second in the world all time rankings behind late Florence Griffith Joyner. 19 year old American 18 Moon, who won the women's 800 meter Olympic title, won the female rising star, while Arian Knighton, who finished fourth in the men's 200 meter finals in Tokyo, won the men's rising stars award. That's it on sport names. I am Adeni Ajishafe. And before we wrap it up on News Hour, here's a kicker. A bumper harvest in Bangladesh has put smiles, particularly for farmers in Manikani district, northwest of the capital, Dhaka. Despite the extra work that all this bounty demands, it is exceptionally good for these farmers of beans, cauliflower, eggplant, goods, green chili pepper, potatoes, radishes, and tomatoes. Let's take a look. It has been an exceptionally good autumn for farmers in Bangladesh. Many farmers say that the excellent harvests of these particularly profitable early winter crops can be attributed to the Chinese for their help in high yield seeds and proper pest control. আমার নাম মোহাম্মদ হামিদুর রহমান খান আমার বাড়ি সরাজিনপুর সিংহায়ক থানা জেলা মানিকগঞ্জ আমি আমার এই প্লটে দেড় সদর শতাংশ জমি আছে আমি সারা বছরই সবজি ক্ষেতের উপরই নির্ভরশীল এবছর আমি আবার করছি আপনার শ্রীচন্দন যেটা কি বলে শ্রী সেটা আটাশ উনত্রিশ শতাংশ শ্রীচন্দনে গেলে কিন্তু সবই চাই মিজ দিই আমি বহন করছি সমিজে টমেটো মিষ্টি কুমড়া পানি লাউ এগুলো সমস্তই কিন্তু চাইনিজ বীজ বপন করছি সারও আমি চাইনিজ ব্যবহার করি এবং কীটনাশকও চাইনিজ ব্যবহার করি KSM Mostafizu Rahman is managing director of National Agri Care Group, one of the country's biggest importers of pesticides, micronutrients and growth regulators. You know, we have started our business back in 2002. At that time, I selected China because they have so many competitive advantages by in terms of price, in terms of hospitality, cooperation. In all aspects, I found it is good, just good. Then I have started my agrochemical business. And during this last two decades, with the cooperation of Chinese private company, government, and all my friends, associates, my company day by day becoming bigger, bigger, and now it is one of the largest agrochemicals company, national agriculture in our country. That is the driving force to develop our economy. 
with the help of Chinese private and public sector partnership with Bangladeshi private and public sector businessmen. And with that, we conclude News Hour for this evening. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us across all our social media platforms. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. Thanks for joining us.